Thanks for joining us today. I'm Mina Chung from Cleveland Clinic, and I'm pleased to be joined here today by Dr. Sanjum Sethi, who's uh, at the Columbia University Medical Center in the hub of things in New York City. So welcome uh, and thanks for, for your attention. Uh, Dr. Sethi has given a presentation on COVID-19 and venous thromboembolism, a view from the PERT team. So maybe we can start off, Dr. Sethi, with a little summary of, of your presentation, or just let us know your, your experience with the PERT team during this COVID-19 period. Thank you all for, uh, for doing this interview. Happy to share our thoughts and our experiences. Um, you know, it's, as things have been evolving, it's actually changed quite rapidly. Uh, we're actually doing a lot better from the standpoint of new patients coming into the system. But what we noticed during the real surge in March and April was that the number of consults we were getting on our PERT team, number of patients with concern for thromboembolism or uh, frank thromboembolism was a lot higher than what we noted historically when we're taking care of patients. And I think that the question that is underlying that we're all trying feverishly to investigate is what is the vascular complication incidence with COVID-19? Does it predispose us to more vascular complications? Is this just a manifestation of the fact that the patients are critically ill anyway, which obviously uh, predisposes to thrombosis, that they're sedentary, they're in the ICU setting. But I think we all uh, believe that there is a, another reason that is specific to COVID-19, that these patients are especially prone to thrombosis, um, and that it's a, a really a viral uh, effect or a effect related um, to um, the inflammation that the virus produces. So um, what kind of an increase in, in your PERT team consults did you see? It was, I, I, did you compare to, I, you must have compared to prior um, periods? Yeah, so we actually found a, a, almost an exactly threefold increase. So we did an analysis of our uh, control patients March and April of 2019, and then March and April of 2020, uh, which is really the initial, the surge really happened mid-March. So it sort of captures that time period. Um, and we found that we were getting three times as many consults. And uh, a lot of those have frank uh, VTE. Some of them were more just suspicion of VTE um, or arterial thrombosis as well. And the interesting thing was that as we all rotated through the ICUs, we were all repurposed for different things during that time. The incidence of uh, CVVH cl uh, filters clotting, the incidence of lying thromboses, you know, the nurses felt um, who really deal with these uh, things at the bedside, that these were happening a lot more often than normally happens in a critically ill patient, even a critically ill patient with something like influenza or, or another virus. So it really, um, I think, speaks to the fact that um, there is likely an association. Now, it's going to be difficult to understand until we get prospective data, um, really, um, truly, to, to eliminate all of the bias. But when you look at, there's data from the Netherlands, data from France, um, and data from China, as well as some of the American centers are now coming out with their, their data um, that we talked about in, really in the presentation, that, we're, that in th those patients who are tested, we're seeing about a 25 to 30% incidence of uh, VTE in particular, but some arterial thromboses as well. Um, and, and this is, now this is, this is subject to the selection bias of those who are tested, um, but it, it does speak to a, a likely high burden of disease in this population. Could you uh, speak to biomarkers that could be associated with it, D-dimer or others, and yeah. do you use that to, to uh, guide your treatment? Sure. D-dimer has certainly been um, at the forefront. There was a very early analysis from China that suggested those who had elevated D-dimer rates um, had a much higher rate of venous thromboembolism. We actually are doing an analysis of D-dimer um, and the association. And I think there's, 
it, yes, so D-dimer is likely associated, but D-dimer is relatively nonspecific. And there, it is also elevated in various inflammatory states, including COVID-19 as well. And so I think while it certainly heightens our suspicion, I think there was enthusiasm in the beginning for treating solely based on D-dimer. And I think the entire clinical picture needs to be taken into account. And, I, and we don't, at least on our center, encourage prophylactic. Actually, let me rephrase. We don't encourage patients without confirmed VTE to receive therapeutic anticoagulation based on D-dimer alone. Um, what kind of prophylaxis do you use? On uh, They're bedridden, obviously, so. Yeah, so standard prophylaxis, certainly. I think a lo uh, there, the question about uh, increasing the dose of prophylaxis um, is certainly warranted. We are uh, doing a randomized control trial to look at more intensive anticoagulation, not therapeutic, we call it intermediate dose, um, or a higher prophylaxis, prophylaxis dose. Many other centers are, th are studying therapeutic anticoagulation or some form of increased degree of anticoagulation, particularly in those patients who um, are felt to be at higher risk. Thank you. Can you give us an idea as to the spectrum of VTE or arterial thrombus? Where are you seeing it? I, I recall that you had some unusual sites like the RV. Um, were you, was it yeah. was that mainly based from lower extremity deep venous thrombosis? Or what kind of thrombosis mm -hmm. are you seeing? Yeah, so this is this is very interesting because it's continuing to evolve, and some of it, some of the data is going to be limited by what testing was performed early on uh, during the search. But what we're we're finding is that a couple of different things. So one is that there's some there's a good paper in the New England Journal about a pulmonary microthrombi, and is this in situ thrombosis or pulmonary microthrombus happening in the in the in the pulmonary arterial tree. So there's not only sort of gross macroscopic PEs, uh, but uh, there are also microthrombi and a combination of the two things. And I think the majority of the events in the, in the literature are pulmonary embolism. We and centers in New York where we're collaborating to, to understand this a little bit better, found a number of patients with RV thrombosis. And just for, uh, um, uh, sort of comparison, uh, clot in transit or, or, or uh, RA clot is less than 10% of PEs or you know, PE associated that's picked up. And then of those, um, a very, very small percentage are in the RV. So it's really mainly RA clot. So to find numerous right ventricular thrombi is very unusual. Um, I mean, in a given year, we would find maybe one at, at most, and we had five or six in the span of um, three weeks. And so it's, it, I think, again, speaks, and whether or not th these are clots that are transiting from the legs, we're picking them on the way, um, or whether they are in situ thrombosis from the RV dysfunction, I think is still being elucidated, uh, but it, it does beg the question. That's really interesting. So it sounds like it's much more than microvascular thromboses. Um, do you have any thoughts as to etiology, why, why this is happening? I think that vascular endothelium is, is certainly involved. Uh, I, I, there is, it, we know that most inflammatory states across coronary and vascular medicine increase the rate of thrombosis, whether that be um, the uh, inflammatory hypothesis involved in acute coronary syndrome or the uh, in inflammation that we, we know, such as malignancy, predisposes to, um, to VTE. And so we certainly know that, and I think that the hyperinflammatory state of COVID-19 um, causes changes in the vascular endothelium that um, predispose to thrombosis. Again, now this is just based on, on uh, the literature so far and, and what we're learning. But to me, that seems to be the most plausible mechanism going, uh, that's, that's, that's been discussed. So you mentioned this, these associations. So um, we know that people with prior cardiovascular comorbidities, hypertension, coronary disease, diabetes are more prone to uh, complications or more serious disease. Do we see that association 
with uh, the thrombosis that you're seeing? It's a really good question. I think we need to dive a little deeper into figuring which of those associations is, is more prominent. Um, I, I can tell you that uh, obesity certainly seems to be a, a marker of severe disease in, in uh, COVID-19. And obviously obesity uh, tracks with all of those uh, traditional cardiovascular risk factors such as hypertension, diabetes, et cetera. So I think as a gestalt, we are seeing that, but I think being more specific about, is it diabetes, is it hypertension, is it metabolic syndrome, is it insulin resistance? What is the actual sort of, is it just the inflammation associated with obesity? Or, you know, what is the, the actual uh, causative or associative at least mechanism, um, I think is still being understood fully, but certainly those who are, have cardiovascular uh, risk factors are more at risk for severe disease and, and uh, VTE presumptively um, as well. And are, are you seeing this in young people presenting now since there's uh, seem, there seems to be an increase in younger uh, people presenting with COVID-19? Yeah, you know, the younger, so the younger patients that we saw during the surge certainly had evidence of severe disease and evidence of, of VTE. The younger patients we're seeing now are not nearly as critically ill. So they aren't being tested at the same rate for some of these other complications. And I'll be you know, forthright that our, our volume, fortunately, has not been um, uh, affected by some of the reopening that has been going on. And so I think that um, some of that question is going to rely on obtaining data from some of those places that are harder hit now and understanding, uh, you know, is, is this, um, but my, my suspicion is that if you have a severe form of the disease, regardless of age, that you, you're at risk for venous thromboembolism and, and arterial thrombosis as well. Can you uh, uh, tell us how you treat the thromboembolism? Do you use antiplatelets, anticoagulants, anything special sure. for treating? Sure. Sure. Um, especially in the beginning of uh, the, the surge when we were still trying to understand how to um, appropriately uh, protect our healthcare workers and our staff. We were really trying to push patients to get an oxyparin instead of, instead of ultra-fractionated heparin um, because of the, uh, need, the less need for our frequent checks um, and the steady state uh, dose. Um, the questions about sort of long-term management with the uh, direct oral anticoagulants as opposed to Lovenox or, or uh, anoxaparin or uh, warfarin, I think is still an uh, ongoing question. We have been using the, the direct oral anticoagulants and those um, once they leave the ICU and they're in more stable footing. Uh, but we do use a spectrum of anoxaparin, unfractionated heparin, and, and a novel anti or direct oral anticoagulants um, with an emphasis on trying to use an oxyparin where possible just to limit the number of exposure for, for the staff. So that's interesting. Um, so when you use the, the NOAX or DOAX, have you seen any bleeding complications that have had to be reversed? And then, you know, with the reversal agent, do you see what do you yeah. see, you know, thrombotic tendencies with that? We've seen bleeding complications in the uh, critically ill patients, not on those medicines, but on, on things like heparin and, and anoxaparin, which is one of the reasons that we are um, a little bit more cautious with being, um, we're more cautious of being liberal with, with those medicines if there isn't a confirmed thrombotic event. Um, however, the, the, with the direct oral anticoagulants, once a patient has been stabilized and is, uh, is sort of on their way uh, towards discharge, we haven't so far, um, at least, uh, anecdotally seen an increased risk of, of bleeding. It's good to hear. Uh, have, have you been able to follow any of these patients to see if there are long-term sequelae of, of the thrombosis you've seen? It's a great question. We're actively working on our protocols to make sure that these patients are being captured. What we are concerned about, and, and I, I work with the, the CTEF, uh, the chronic thromboembolic team quite closely, and what we're concerned about is that there's going to be an increased rate of chronic thromboembolic disease down the road, uh, which 
we want to make sure that we capture and treat appropriately and treat aggressively. As we know about that disease process, it really is that the earlier you get in to treat them and potentially debulk the lungs, the, the, be the better the outcome can potentially be for those kinds of patients. And so, you know, what is interesting is we are seeing even we are seeing a surge right now in the number of VTE cases presenting into the hospital uh, without COVID-19. So without um, PCR positive COVID-19. And I think uh, what another interesting point that we didn't talk about in the presentation is we are um, thinking about whether we should be testing these patients for antibodies to see whether they have latent infection or, or subclinical infection. And what is a thrombotic risk post-infection, as well as is it just a, a function of being sedentary from quarantine at home, um, a shelter in place, or, or ignoring their symptoms because they didn't want to seek medical treatment. But we are still um, having an increased rate of, of consults, and these are rear PEs that we normally sort of see. And so that also is something we're going to um, have to once it, it, it's a little bit um, stabilizes, dive into the, the, the numbers and see what's going on. Yeah, that's really interesting since so many people at home are also just very sedentary. Well, thank you very much for your thoughts. Do you have anything else that uh, our viewers uh, you know, might like to hear about uh, from your point of view on this topic? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think to sort of summarize, uh, I, I think that we have uh, under, we are understanding more and more that there is a likely increase uh, incidence. Um, I, I hesitate to use that word because it still it really is an association, but I think evidence is pointing towards the fact that there is something about COVID-19 that predisposes us to uh, predisposes patients to to venous thromboembolism, and that we probably need to be be more aggressive in our treatment above standard. But I think defining that patient that's going to benefit. Um, without the risks is, I think, still an open question. And, and I think enrolling our patients in a safe way, those who have equipoise into randomized control trials to understand these questions, there's plenty going on, including our center across the country, will allow us to then have the evidence going forward of how to best treat these patients. And that way, it will reduce some of the variation between, uh, between centers, sites, and even individual clinicians. Um, uh, as to the degree and, and, and of treatment. All right, I think we can't overemphasize the, the importance of really studying this, even on a, you know, not just the clinical incidence, but the basic mechanism. So hopefully, right. you know, as uh, we, uh, centers can be collecting blood, collecting samples, and really trying to get to the root cause of what's happening um, in the vasculature, you know, is it, ACE2 expression on the endothelium. So we're seeing, if, you know, are we seeing virus in the endothelium in the blood vessels? Yeah, we, no, I, I agree. I mean, I think the more we all collaborate, um, you know, as, as, as you are well aware, I think the more we all collaborate and combine our, our data, combine our sample size, make our sample size bigger, um, uh, we'll leverage uh, both our time, our, our energies, and, and our, our patients to, to, you know, get really good answers um, to these questions. Great. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Thank you. And so thanks to everybody for watching this, and uh, we hope that this has been a valuable session to you. Uh, please be safe out there, and um, be well.